Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to those watching and here. Um, this is the Dow Governance Education Sessions. Um, and today we're gonna have David Phelps talk about joke Yay. Dow and other things. <laughs> Welcome, David. The floor Welcome. is yours. Yeah, yeah, just I have an hour of stand-up material that I'm, I'm gonna subject you all to. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Um, um, so I guess to start, uh, should, I, should I give an intro of, uh, of joke Dow and then what we do? Yeah, like a TLDR would be great. The TLDR. So we are decentralized on-chain governance. Um, what that means is that traditionally in governance, you've had core teams submitting proposals to their community to approve, disprove, um, pick favorite options from. What we do instead is we allow community to um, submit their own proposals. Um, and so what this means is a contest uh, on, on JokeDAO is, starts with a prompt. So the prompt can be you know, anything from tell a joke to what do you see as big issues to what do you think we should focus on in our community to uh, we really want to prioritize real world asset management and we have $5,000 that we're going to allocate to an initial version of that. So please permit, you know, submit your proposal to that. It can, it can be anything for creation, grants, endorsements, bounties, uh, user generated roadmaps, um, uh, content creation, et cetera, et cetera. And so the community responds by saying, here's what we think. Um, and then they vote on their favorite options. And so really there's two innovations here. One is in the submission period when people are, are the community is submitting their proposals. Uh, again, you have it coming from the community directly. So for example, we have like Packy McCormick used us to say, what article do you want me to write? And his readers were all able to write in and say, here's an, here's an idea for an article we want you to write. Um, so they're submitting to him rather than vice versa. And the other innovation is um, on the voting side, because it's ranked choice voting, you now have um, an actual list of what a community prioritizes, and you can see the passion for each option. So in traditional, like if you take a traditional grants process where it's yes, no voting, you might have five proposals for grants, and they might all go through, and then you have to pay all of them out. But like if you did it our way, you would have each of those being submitted and then people would vote on their favorites and all the resources would go to the one the community cares most about. Um, so you get a much better sense of the actual prioritization. The, the final element is we wanna make governance fun. <laughs> uh, governance is often not very fun. Uh, it, it's boring at best and uh, uh, warlike at worst. And so a lot, of, a lot of this is really a gamification of governance where you're playing this game of the points that you have to give and the time left in the round to give them. There might be rewards attached to this, there might not. Um, and then thinking, how do you strategize? Do I put all my votes towards that one option that I think no one else cares about? Because if I do that, now it might stand a chance and it might socially signal everyone else that they should support it. On the other hand, maybe I don't want to give all my votes to that one because I don't know, so I'll put a few votes towards that and then see if others start supporting it too. And so it, it can actually you know, build up this whole gamification process where you can have teams emerge of people all trying to work together, building relationships. And you know, fundamentally, we really believe that the point of governance is not figuring out whatever the top option is. The point of governance is actually creating better relationships between people um, in order to make that decision. Um, so the decision itself is secondary to the relationships that you're building with, with teams, et cetera. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's the quick overview for, for what's driving us. Um, if it's helpful to actually look at one, I will share my screen and I will show the contest that uh, I did for today. So give me a second. So here you can see a, can you guys see it on screen? Maybe. Yep. Yeah, you can see it. Yep, so we did a, we did a quick one for, um, uh, for the talk today where I said, you know, what is the number one issue you see in governance? And then we had a few different people here submit options. Levels of centralization versus decentralization by issue and DAO uh, was one. Complicated proposal process was another. Incentive structure was a third. And then um, and then during the voting period, had a, a clear number one winner here. Uh, although there might have been some issues with not everyone getting the voting tokens in time. Uh, <laughs> it might have led to this. But uh, you can see, yeah. So number one was levels of centralization. If I click on that, here, uh, I can actually get a full breakdown and we can see, oh, no wonder it won. <laughs> now you know, because it's the uh, Spaceman that's, SP. That's the game, gamification. You drop token just to one person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, to win. Is Spaceman SP on this call? OK, so we can, we can hate on uh, Spaceman SP for throwing this entire contest towards themselves. 
Um, yeah, I mean, you can export the data if you want to give rewards to people for voting, et cetera, you can do that. There's, you can build out Dune dashboards. You can see the alignment of voters and how often people are voting and uh, reward them accordingly as well. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, yeah, you can see, I think, here exactly, exactly how it works. Um, so before I continue, um, I, I know many of you were forced to, to listen to me before, but I, I want to check any, any questions or anything I can answer. Yeah, I have a few. Um, so you were saying that governance is about relationships. Yes. Um, okay. Can you expand on that? Like how, because what I was hearing, um, based in terms of like the proposals with like Joe Dow, for example, is that like governance can provide insight on community sentiment on whether, what are those community priorities? But what I've also been recognizing in, in Dow governance is that those prior those community priorities wouldn't actually match with what is best for the Dow. So an example would be like, oh, let's throw a party. And everybody's like, yeah, I love to throw a party, but a we party. have no money. Like, you know what I mean? Or let's focus on this, but we it, this project isn't sustainable. So like yep. all of the efforts in that is not actually not best for the Dow. So like my question is, is that how to, to make governance fun makes sense in terms of a gamification approach in terms of the process. But yep. I think that the biggest gap is really how do we kind of teach our community members when they're voting for something that how they can develop much more informed decisions to know yep. what's best for the DAO and not just for vibes. Yeah, great, great, great question. So what I'll come back to in a minute is some actual use cases for, for, for us in DAO governance. And I would say one would be, again, thinking about you know, relative prioritization. If you say to your community, we have $20,000 to use this quarter, um, what do we want to use it on? And then you have, you build up soft consensus first. I mean, look, if they decide that they want to spend it on parties, that's their decision. Um, but you know they probably will be aware that they are destroying the token value because they're depleting the budget on something that is not accruing any value to the project as a whole. Um, or maybe it is. Maybe they think it is, right? But but I think that goes to the to the. So I'll come back to that, right? Like just being able to to have to step back, say what your budget is, and then express level you know relative levels of prioritization really matters because yeah if you went to everyone and you said should we have a party they're all going to say yeah but if you say what are the top things we should focus on they're probably a lot less likely to put a party as a top three right um and so again that's why the prioritization uh, piece matters but also why like stepping back and like broadly assessing your goals like as broadly as possible is really the important first step for using us before you go deeper i think as well um, but the but the other point here, right, is like this is also why relationship building matters because like an individual might be like, ah, oh, yeah, rager, you know, themes house, let's go, love this DAO. You know, it might be important for them to build some relationships with other people who are like, you know, we also love partying too, but like we fundamentally feel if we can build revenue first, we can actually have eighteen parties next year. Um, so like if we defer a little bit, you know, this is really going to help our goals in raging. Uh, and then the guy, be like, oh yeah, that's awesome. All right, let's build some revenue first then, right? So like you, you, need, to, you need to have that social cohesion, um, partly because social cohesion is a form of education. It's a way for people to educate each other on different perspectives uh, and to have different goals. Like, I think we've taken it for granted that governance should just express individuals' own opinions without any sort of interference from broader community input. Um, because at scale, that's the best way to do it. If you have 300 million people, there is not a chance for them to get into a room and talk to each other about each other's point of views. And as we see continuously in a country with 300 million people, the opposite happens, which is they break down completely and they have no ability to, to relate to each other. Um, but if you have a small group of 10 people, there's a massive opportunity for diplomatic discussion, campaigning, debate um, in that small group. And like, Fundamentally, I think that's part of the big unlock of DAOs is being small because it allows for those conversations and community building that you can't get at scale. And so it really changes what we think governance should be 
if you can actually build those relationships and have people talk to each other and educate each other as well. Um, and so, and ultimately it becomes more meaningful too, because if you just participate in a vote and you know you're doing it publicly and you realize you're in the minority and no one else agrees with you, like you probably feel bad or you don't want to participate or you don't want to be part of that community anymore. But if it's done in a way where like you're talking, you're engaging with other people, you're debating with them, you're building relationships, you're, you're strategizing, coming to social consensus, it's much more like a game where you can build coalitions um, that will be long lasting and like beyond whatever the result is of that decision is, you've actually built a lot better retention in the DAO for people to be able to work together um, long term as well. Mkar. Yeah, actually, this is this is a really good point. Like I was thinking about it uh, today uh, while I was riding my bike uh, about like because I'm part of like some like bigger DAOs, let's say, and some smaller groups. And at a small group, we usually have like open conversations, you know, everyone has their own opinion and we can kind of draw some conclusions, let's say from it. But when, I, when I'm a part of like the bigger DAOs, uh, where it's like 80 people, 50 or 100 people, like it feels like very different. Like it feels like we are already like getting into like politics and like, I cannot say this because I need to keep this information for later uh, to, you know, attack when like needed or like, you know, have advantage over something. Like it's getting into like strategizing almost like uh, what you actually say and don't say. Like, have you been thinking what's the threshold there? Like, is it like 10 people, eight people, 15? Or when, when like, because, I, maybe it's going back to your article uh what you wrote like when do you think like this actually cohesion is breaking like or why it's breaking yeah there's there's not necessarily a perfect answer for this because every size probably has different amount you know um like different operations that work best for it um but like yeah, you look at traditional schooling environments like, uh, you know, groups at the cafeteria, the two pizza teams, like six to eight people is pretty maxed out in terms of everyone's ability to speak openly um, with each other, both in terms of the time they have to speak, but also like their comfort level in speaking to a group without worrying about someone hating them, right? So like, like that's on the one side, you know, um, probably a maximum like number it's quite small and then on the other side would be like 300 million people or whatever for empires you know it, the in-between is very difficult and so a lot of DAOs really struggle because like having 500 people is kind of a worst of both worlds um you're not getting the benefits of scale but you are not getting the benefits of intimacy either um you know something i've thought about with us is that that i think it's really cool is like just using contests as a data surfacing mechanism to figure out what people's priorities are. So like, I haven't seen this done, but I think what would be really cool would be, um, as a use case would be, you say, you do a contest, what do people care about? Let's say there's a number 10 option that is like not that supported by the group as a whole, but you're in that coalition who's like supports that number 10 option. Well, what you could do is you could export the data you could airdrop everybody like a PO app or a token, you can mint a token, whatever, an NFT, um, but you could just airdrop them like, you know, whatever you want. And then you could set up something on Guild uh, and create like a community for anyone who supported that option where they now can join. And so like you can actually start to create these like subgroups, um, you know, within the DAO um, so that, you know, you're not forking it necessarily or breaking it up, but you are creating like smaller groups for you to be able to coordinate and say, hey, I want to find these other people. And like the way I described it is a little cumbersome because like a multi-party messaging is not a thing yet in crypto. And I think it's a huge missing piece. Like imagine how easy it'd be if you could just go to our contest and just message everyone else who like also voted for the option and be like, hey, I noticed we all have the same priorities. Maybe we can all work together and build this together. Um, like, so, yeah, I do think like actually governance and, and fracturing groups in some ways is actually a really good use case. Um, as well as building consensus and, and, and cohesion too. Um, but yeah, the Dunbar number, right, is like 150 or whatever. But um, I don't know, my own experience, I've just like, even building stuff, like six people's a lot. 
<laughs> like we've been we've been talking so far for what twenty minutes. There's six of us on the call. Only three of us have spoken so far, right? <laughs> and I know it's my job to speak here, but like six is already a huge number. <laughs> No, I think I think I think that's that's correct. Like you know, like uh, when we are getting above the two pizzas uh, group or something like that, it's just it's not anymore like one team. It's like really getting into like multiple. We are basically starting to break those groups into multiple groups because we just don't have time to share everyone's opinion and these kind of things. Yeah. And it's also possible, right, that the number's smaller for remote because, like, if it's so hard to stay focused on a remote call <laughs> than if you're in the room with a pizza, right? Like, Zoom, Google Meets are like anti pizzas. They like make it very, very difficult to <laughs> to maintain cohesion. So it might be like three, you know, for <laughs> for remote, which is which is almost deadly to think about. Sorry, Fumes. No worries. I mean, I think that the biggest, so also just like reflecting on the maker DAO issue and how you had different groups, right? And so there were this term called like the centralist and they're the ones who are like, you know, yeah. just want to get the work done. And, and I've kind of been having like conflicting feelings about that because I can resonate with it because like I do things with intention, right? And so when I'm entering governance, what's most frustrating is that nobody knows why they're there or why they're doing it in the first place, right? Yeah. And so then it's like, why should somebody care about a proposal happening if it doesn't directly impact them? Like, I think that we had somewhat of like a utopian ideal of like when people were gonna enter DAOs that it was gonna be different as if they don't live in the real world, right? Where like yeah. people's individuals' motivations are dri driven by that and you could also see that like a joke out too right like whoever gets tokens or whatever whoever votes whatever you like right and so i think that when we're looking at governance like we should ask ourselves like why people should give an ish <laughs> when submitting this proposal like why does this matter and then yeah. when in when like send submitting the proposal don't just like do the whole like if we build it they will come like if i submit it like people will respond it's like okay now how do i market it and how do I find my allies to do that? And I think that we've kind of forgotten how politics works in real world, that we can yep. actually just do the same thing in this world, but better and more transparent. And I think that that's where my frustrations are, is that like, I'm the kind of person who likes to get things done. I do things with intention. And so when I'm in environments or DAOs that like, it's just like hubbled, I feel like the centralist. <laughs> like, you know right. what I mean? Right, right. Yeah. Um, and it, I mean, there's there's a, a few things to say here. One is that, you know, like crypto community was built on this idea of credible neutrality, objectivity, devs, like really almost like, you know, breakdown of state, libertarian politics. And so like the idea of a trustlessness, like all of these are like ideas of like letting code rule. Um, and so like now realizing that actually what we're building requires tons of trust, tons of subjectivity, tons of campaigning, and actually to succeed in a DAO, you have to become a politician, um, is like very hard for the crypto community, I think in particular, to, to, to assimilate um, because it's so almost antithetical to the entire values, right, of, of the history of crypto to, to think this way. But it's absolutely true. Like this is about human coordination and like, human coordination is relationship building and like that is something that takes time it takes effort it takes campaigning it takes lobbying and like there's a massive need for lobbyists uh within within DAOs. And we might not like it but it's yeah it's it's i think it's huge so not am i am i saying your name right i i think i am not so please correct me but you're muted you're muted whoops yeah no it's senate so that's okay. <laughs> Hi, nice, nice to meet you. By the way, I think we saw each other uh, at the first time we presented joke out, and but I haven't talked, so excited. Cool, excited to be here. Yeah. Um, no, very interesting discussion. And Fims and I work closely together, so um, <clears throat> we know each other. And she also likes that I'm sort of the type of person that likes to get things done. And I'm very well aware of the fact that if it's everybody's responsibility, then it's nobody's or no one's. And so I've been like questioning a lot and you know thinking through 
some structures that we currently have and as Fiends already has mentioned so what learnings can we take from the traditional world sort of and implement and make it better make it more transparent and make it agile and flexible and adjustable over time um and so i ended up just asking myself um basically how how do you motivate pe people to get things done uh, in an environment where decision making is more decentralized, like let's say decentralized, and you don't have this this centralized um, this this one person at the end that says, "Okay, now we are going to do that." You know what I mean? So, yeah, this would be. It. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, a couple of thoughts here. One is that centralization is the most efficient option. It also is the one that will tend to defer to the experts, and these are both good. These are both highly in favor of centralization, right? Like centralization, highly efficient, also means the experts, whoever they are, get say. The problem is how do you define who an expert is and who defines that? And often it's the experts themselves who define what an expert is, right? Um, but like there is absolutely, I think, strong cases for delegation and letting core team members make their own decisions and and have control. Like, you know the unlock of a DAO is not a DAO approving every decision that a core team makes. That's highly inefficient. And, and that's not what it's useful for. What, what the unlock for a DAO is getting community say um, so that they can, their ideas can be unlocked and used by the core team is, is what I would say, right? Like it should be about the creativity of the community rather than they're just their simple yes, no validation. And some of this again comes out of blockchains. Like blockchains are run so that there's a core you know, block builder, and then there's, you know, a, a series of nodes that validate it, and those are the original DAOs. And so, like, we've accepted that, like, the Java community is validation, but I don't think the Java community is validation. I think the Java community is creativity, but, and then the job of the core team is to process that and use it as, as they want to. Um, so, like, I would say there are actually still strong cases for centralization within DAOs, but those need to be delegated, and that also, that power needs to be consent of the governed, right? Like, a community can delegate to someone, but maybe that delegate, yeah, like that decays over time unless it's constantly renewed. Like there needs to be ways that like, you know, the community is still fundamentally the ones who are giving power to those who then use it. Um, I don't I don't know if that answered answered the question. The the um what else is it gonna say? Um we are yeah, um themes to your point about like having to market, we are thinking about we are about to start building something called tournament mode and we're still figuring out how to do this. But basically the idea would be like, you would get two proposals and you would pick which one you prefer. So you'd have A and B and then like, you know, if I prefer A, B goes away, then option C comes up, right? And then I have to pick again and say which one I prefer. And so you get a lot of data that you can iterate really quickly. And so like if there's 5,000 proposals, you don't have to have everyone look at 5,000 proposals. They could just look at 10 proposals each but like you're getting a lot of data on what the community as a whole prefers. And what's really nice about this is it means instead of just like going to your friend's proposal and voting on it because it's the one you know, you actually now have to consider individual proposals and relative to each other. And so hopefully it does account for a little bit of that bias of just like supporting your friends, um, like which is both, a, it's both the best and worst thing I think about DAOs. <laughs> um, I was, so we had a scenario, well actually this is common where everybody just says yes to, to things. Yeah. Um, and sometimes those yes to things aren't the best, but yep. because they've been voted on, we have yep. to enact it. So like, what are some of the kind of ideas or things that yep. you're kind of exploring to prevent the the lazy minting process or the lazy yeah. yes process? Yeah. yeah, so that that's why rank choice is really important, right? Is because when you when you put yes no options to a community, like one of two things happens. Either everyone votes yes because of social optics, like they feel like they have to, they don't want to look bad, and so you get these like votes that are like ninety nine percent yes, right? And and first of all, you should be skeptical because you're like, wait, why is everyone voting for this? Are they just doing it, you know, because they feel socially obliged because it's yes, no. And so if you do rank choice, that changes because now like, like I've seen it myself when I put proposals up. If, if it loses because people voted no, I feel really angry. But if it loses because it wasn't one of the top three options, like I don't feel that bad. I'm like, it doesn't mean people didn't like it. It just, they didn't vote against it. They just voted for something else. So like psychologically, everything starts to shift. Like you're no longer concerned about social optics as a voter. And as a proposal, you're also like less concerned that people are actively saying no to you. 
as well, right? So like, it just becomes a much better relationship building process when you have like ranked choice voting like that to pick which ones. But the much bigger point here, right, is that it actually like lets you prioritize because again, like if you have a grants round and you have 10 people submit grants, they might all get a yes vote and they might all get grants. But like if you did it with ranked choice voting and you said, we're only going to, you know, give money to the top three, you're going to give a lot more money to a lot fewer options than the ones the community really supports. And so like you're much, much better able to prioritize as well. So I think it solves like on the social side and solves there. And then the final thing I was going to say is the times that you see no votes, like you see things fail are often because there's a bunch of different reasons that people don't support something and the different no blocks come together. So like someone doesn't support the timeline, someone doesn't support the budget, someone doesn't support the team, right? And so even though they might like the idea as a whole, we've seen this in Lido, we've seen this in Maker, like they like the idea of the proposal, but they disagree on the details. You actually see these like really good proposals get shot down because the details are wrong. And so like, again, like the, I'll, I'll come back to this in a second, but like one really good use case for us is like submitting alternate versions of a proposal to figure out which one is the best one. Right. I think I might have talked about this in the call last time, but like Lido did a treasury diversification where they were like, should we give, you know, 1% to Dragonfly? But there's no lockup period, vesting, you know, anything. And so it, it went down, but not because people didn't support it, just they didn't like the details of it. And then Lido just like said, all right, let's try another version. And then they put that to the community. But like, you know, if they'd used us instead, you actually would have had people iterate on it with a lot of different versions of this proposal. And the best one that was supported by the community would have gone to the top without you just guessing in the dark for like a random one that happens to get enough votes to pass. Um, so yeah, it, is it may, maybe it's helpful for me to step back and like say like a few like really clear cut use cases for DAO governance for us. And then maybe thinking about how like Bankless or Index or like others could use it. Is that is that useful? It's your show, whatever you want to do. I, um, I think maybe before we start, like uh, Senad has uh, this, his hand raised. Oh my God, I missed that. Sorry, Senad. Yeah, I, it, it would just be one more question with regards to <clears throat> making informed decisions. So what we have is we have sort of two problems to solve, in my opinion. The first one will be governance participation in current structures, such as token weighted voting. Uh, not like not specifically to joke though. Let's say uh, general token weighted voting as well as making the decision. So what we do have sometimes is, for example, I take Bankless DAO as an example. Let's say we have on average like 20 to 30 votes per proposal, uh, sometimes even less. There are some budget proposals that are getting um, uh, not even up to 10 votes. But the even bigger issue is you often have links, uh, uh, hyperlinks in that proposal for uh, more information to check out, information that is even more important uh, to even make that decision. Uh, and so, and when you actually look at that, it's maybe a, a small percentage, not even a percentile of uh, the people press on that to actually vote. And so how can we, um, and I think this is like re really important because we focus a lot on how can we increase participation, but I think we have an even bigger problem is how can we increase the, the, the competence that has to, like how can we ensure the competence that has to go into for making uh, decisions and uh, making this as decentralized as possible because we don't want to end up you know centralizing everything and be, let's say these are the subject matter experts because you know as you said they they take everything into account but like um is an incentive model an incentive structure the solution is this reverse uh, uh psychological approach that you just described instead of approve or disapprove let's rank the votes like what is your sort of yeah. view on that what would you recommend let's say bankless now comes to you and says please yeah. solve this problem what yeah. would you say what would your yeah. advice be great 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 question and and just to back up right you're getting at this like a really amazing tension that's always always there which is like you know do we want to like give more power to the people who vote most frequently and like you know try to encourage everyone to vote more like you hear all the time, like the problem is that not enough people are participating in governance, right? And so like, how do we get people to participate more? But you're actually saying the opposite, which I, I tend to agree with you, which is like, actually the problem is too many people are participating without understanding what's there, right? Like actually we need fewer people participating in this because we need people who actually have educated themselves, right, on it as well. And so like, 
it, it's such a good question. Like, you know, is the problem in DAOs right now that not enough people are participating or that too many people are participating? And and my answer for this would be like the way we set it up with Joke DAO is like you send a voting token um, to your voters. And 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 there's two unlocks here. One is you get to choose who that voting token goes to. The other is you get to choose how many voting tokens they get. So um, we're gonna, I'm putting up a proposal to MakerDAO later today for one where every single person who owns Maker as of a week ago would get one, you know, get a hundred voting tokens. And so like the people with very little will ha count just as much as the people with a lot. And so like your wealth won't matter, you will have the equal say, right? That's one way to do it. But I think like what the solution for what you're describing would be to say, look, there's a mandatory hour if you wanna vote. And that mandatory hour is where everyone's gonna present and talk about this and you have to be at that debate if you want to vote. And at the end of that debate, we're going to drop a link where you can join a guild group, right? And you join that guild group, and then we'll airdrop everybody who joined that guild group, something like that. And you can also do it with POAPs too, right? And just you claim your POAP and then airdrop to everyone who has that POAP. Um, like there's a, you know, there's different mechanisms for doing it, but like fundamentally say like the only people who get to vote in this are the people who like took the time to attend this presentation, et cetera. Um, like, it's it's such a good question because like I just have that question of the question, which is like, do we want more people participating or fewer? And it kind of depends on the it kind of depends on on what exactly the vote is, right? As well, um, the, like so. This is this is what I'll run through next. I guess is like you know my general strategy is like thinking start really broadly and as generally as possible in a way to include everyone, and then get more and more precise, more detailed, more granular, and more advanced. Um, as you as you continue to iterate on a proposal to get it to its final form. So at first, everybody should be participating. By the end subs, you probably only want a very, very few people participating. Um, Artem. Yes, thank you. So, sorry, if the, the background noise, but what about legitimacy? If a few people participate, uh, is it still uh, improving the, the legitimacy of uh, governance? Sorry, sorry, can, can, can you expand on that? Well, I mean, one of the main goals of, go of governance is legitimacy of decision making, right? Right. So if few people participate, as you say, like sometimes it's better that fewer people participate, then how do you make sure that you know, other, people's, other people kind of adhere to those decisions? Yeah, 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 and, and, and still support it. I, I do think that there's like, you know, so so I'll run through this, like what an iterative process could be like for using us. But I do think in some ways the final step is taking whatever the final proposal is and putting that to the broader community and saying yes or no. Like, do you support it? Like, I know I've spoken against yes or no proposals a lot, but like, I do think there's a strong use case if, if you are going through with something where you can get more and more advanced and who gets to shape what that proposal looks like as you iterate. But ultimately, yeah, that does need to be supported by, by the community as a whole. The other things you could do that are interesting are like rewarding people who participated a lot giving them more voting power um, if they've participated in the past, et cetera. Like, the question you're asking is still such a big question now because like founders and VCs still hold most of the DAO tokens, right? And so it's like, if they support it, does that make it more legitimate because they had more tokens, right? And it's it's a plagued question in some ways, uh, but such a good one, such, such a good one. Um, so why don't, because I know we have 20 minutes left, why don't I run through like a few use cases if that's helpful? Um, and then would, uh, yeah, also just love feedback and to maybe brainstorm, like, is this useful to, you know, bankless as well? So I would say like the first use case would be a pulse check. Like a pulse check is just like getting a sense of your community's like, you know, priorities, right? So you could say like, what is bankless? What do you care about in bankless? And like, what do you want us to pursue, right? Like, like what's most important to you for bankless? And someone might be like media, right? It's like the media initiatives are really important. Uh, another one could be like actually like funding projects, right? It would be really important. Another one could be like accruing value to the token, right? Another one could be like parties. Um, and so like everyone could submit and and first like the first thing to say about this is like it makes everyone feel like their voice is heard that they get to participate if they want to. And like I do think that's important that like there's just an opportunity for you to be out there and have your voice heard in some ways. Um, and, and, and have it registered as a bank, you know, as a bank holder. Um, and then you do the vote on it, right? And you get to see like, you know, what are the top priorities here? And maybe it turns out the top priority is like accruing value to the token, 
And that might be a surprise. You might be like, wait, what? That's why everyone's here? But like fundamentally, those are the holders. They have the token. That's what they care about, right? Um, and so this, what's cool with the pulse check is like it's you know it's low stakes. Like you don't have to act on it. You don't have to do anything based on it. It could just be a way to like gauge community sentiment. In some ways, like what we built is really just a problem for user surveys. It's just to like incentivize user surveys to understand what people want. And so instead of doing half hour phone calls with every individual member, you can just get a quick pulse check, right, of, of what they care about. But what's also cool is like you'll see the relative importance of these to each other. So like just because something's number one, it might be one, number one by a long shot, or it might be very close to number two. It might have different alignment of voters. And the stuff we talked about before, you could have people like at the number 10 option who want to meet each other and work on something too. And so like, you know, a lot of those other options become really useful just in being able to see who else voted for them, what they care about, whether you might uh, in running the DAO reach out to them and say, love that you put all of your voting tokens towards this one option, this number six, like you're really passionate about it, maybe you can do something with it. Um, and so, you know, it's it's just a nice way to surface data about what your community actually cares about. So that would be like option one, right? It's like a general pulse check. And as I said, like generally the way I think about it is like start as broadly as possible and then iterate to, to become more and more advanced. So like that's the broad one. And, and the final thing that's nice is like, it doesn't need to be formal. You don't have to have people submitting proposals that have like three headers and four bullet points and a lot of italics and, and, and hyperlinks, right? Like they could just, it could be three words um, and, that's, and that's fine. And so you keep it informal, casual, fun. Uh, you talk it up on social media, you have people compete and hopefully it draws some attention as well because people are campaigning for, for their option to win. You could also add in rewards. Maybe a reward to the winner, um, you know, get some bank tokens. Maybe the people who vote on the winner get some bank tokens. And so, yeah, you can gamify it a little bit as well. Um, the next the next one would then be to say, OK, our top option was accruing value to the token. Now what we want are proposals for how to do that. And now it's a little bit more formal, right? Like we want you to write like a paragraph of text or four bullet points about like how you would like to see value accrued to the token, right? And now you can have people from the community all right in. What's cool about this is it's like, traditionally in proposals, it's the builders who write the proposal. And so they're responsible for both generating the idea and building the idea. And what's happening now with something like this is you have anyone in the community can have the idea, but they don't have to be the ones who build it. Um, and so you've fundamentally opened up the landscape for ideas. But for builders, they now also have like a lot better idea of what the community actually wants from them, right? Because they can actually see the priorities of the community as well and know and know what to focus on. So like for this option, now you might have a bunch of people submit proposals saying like, here's how we want you to accrue value to the token. We want it to unlock events and go to parties. And that way we get our parties as well, right? Or we want it, you know, to be able to uh, you know, be listed more publicly, you know, on exchanges. Like people can you know, put in these proposals that are a little bit more formal and then vote on those and see what those are, right, as well. And then in the third step, what could happen is you could have you could take one of those proposals if it's more formal and make that the prompt, or maybe the core team or the builders on the team will write up a full proposal and say, here's how we're gonna do it, right? Like this is this is what we want to do. So we're gonna start a new token gated events community for bankless uh you know uh participants where holding you know 10 bank tokens will get you invites to these three events you get to go see the live podcast with david uh you know in times square uh you get to go to our new year's eve party etc right and and then they submit that as the prompt and what the community can now do in response is that they can do alternate versions of it so this is what i talked about before where they can say okay we like the idea of this thing but like we you know Times Square seems ridiculous. We're not going to do that. Or like, I don't think the number of tokens is right. Like, we should change that. And so you can have different versions of the proposal circulate uh, and then voting your favorite version of the proposal. And so you see like how we've gone from uh, like in three contests. Contest one was like brainstorming. Contest two was like focusing on like how you would enact this. And then contest three is the best version of that proposal to enact it. Right, and at the end of that, you now have a full proposal, and maybe that one you put to a yes/no vote, and you make sure the builders are still okay with it in building it. Um, but like at that point, you've like really iterated through this process to be able to to come up with something the community's happy with, but is still very much supported by the core team as as well. That's the pitch. <laughs> and you can't do it on snapshot, right? 
So, so Snapshot is always the core team submitting uh, to community. But I would say, I do think, like, I don't think we're competitive with Snapshot. I think, like, we're the iterative soft consensus piece to get to the Snapshot vote. Like, the final step is you would take that proposal and then you'd go to Snapshot, right? And you'd say yes or no. Do you, you know, does the community support this or not? But, like, this is building up to that point so that by the time you get to the Snapshot vote, you have a much better proposal with a lot stronger consensus around it. And then you can use Snapshot for it. But yes, you would not be able to use Snapshot for any of this because Snapshot doesn't have a way for community to be able to submit ideas. Uh, it's not on chain, um, right? And to vote on it, it's not gamified in that way either. Um, so we're really, we're almost like, I've used the term like governance foreplay. Like we're the foreplay and like Snapshot is, is, the, is the fatal act. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to ask like, why extremely token voting? Because like it seems what what benefit it brings. Uh like compare because if soft it's soft consensus, it's not yep. like to determine actually actions. Yep. Like, you know, like what what is the like main advantage of using tokens versus like a poll on the discourse? Yeah, I think that I think there's two big advantages. Um, one is executable contracts. So one is that you could tie certain on-chain um, transactions to the um, to the result of a vote. So you could automatically give rewards. This is the next thing we're building. You could automatically reward the winner, right? And they automatically get paid. It's so like on-chain is just like you know it does open up these like really exciting opportunities for automating um, rewards, transactions, etc. Right? And like long term, you can imagine. You can have meme contests, and the winning meme is automatically minted as an NFT, like these kinds of things as well. Um, you could have composable NFTs where it's like different qualities are voted on, and then those are combined to create a new one. Um, NFT properties can be changed as well. So, like, um, yeah, like, well, I don't know if I'm allowed to share this publicly, but there's a big protocol that's using us right now where they're built, they're forking us, and they're they're going to build a way for NFT. Um, declarations to be minted where people will like vote on a constitution it'll be minted as an nft but then three months later they'll be able to um again uh vote on uh on the declaration and it'll update on the nft not sure i was allowed to share that but it's going to be really soon anyway um so that's like one benefit but i think actually the bigger benefit is data like like just the amount of data that you surface on chain is really useful because now you might want to incentivize people who've participated in governance a lot um, and reward them. Uh, you might want to, again, find the alignment. You might want to be able to track like the passion of people. And so like even like long term, I think what will be really cool is thinking about like inflationary tokens where like people get diluted for not participating in governance over time, right? You can have a token that is like um, that's increasing every week and that all of that is going to people who participated in governance, right? And so like over time, the more you participate, the more power you get within the protocol as well. Um, and without, yeah, while well, making sure that it's still sustainable because it's just inflationary and you're not penalizing anyone directly, but they're getting diluted if they don't participate. So, you know, it's, it's all those pieces too. You can start integrating it with like verifiable credentials and like other pieces too, but like fundamentally the data that you get and your ability to analyze that and decide like what constitutes a winner, what constitutes alignment, what constitutes passion, like that's really the useful unlock for, for DAOs. It's going to be the Dune dashboards, honestly. It's like the huge, the huge piece I think for for on chain voting, and then also the fact that like because that's on chain, it's useful to other other protocols too. Like another protocol can say, hey, we're doing an airdrop. We want to like airdrop to the people who've been really influential in Bankless, and so like because it's all on chain, we can find out who those people are and we can reward them accordingly, right? So the composability that we've seen in DeFi, like I think we're going to see that composability in governance like long term too. I I, I like that. Uh... Basically, you are almost like setting up a standard, like open source standard for voting, so anyone can use it. Maybe eventually, maybe not this year, maybe next year, maybe you know, ten years from now. But th those data and everything will be available for them. It won't be like locked in the centralized database, which cannot be yeah. found probably. Yeah. You're building a record of your contributions, right? Like to the internet. Like that's fundamentally the unlock of on chain. It's like it is a way for you to build and like, you know, a public resume of like your beliefs, you, you know, what you've done, et cetera, that you can then use in all these ways that like even participating in contests right now might like have huge benefits five years from now, 
because you've signaled like you know where you stand and, and how you align and how you contribute in ways that people might not notice now, but they might reward five years from now. Cool. Themes. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so just speaking on on-chain, um, many DAOs and individuals use uh, Snapshot. Yep. And in the early days, like I actually thought Snapshot was on-chain, but Everyone it actually isn't, right? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> there, this is this is like, like, but that's the thing is that like when people are voting with tokens and the narratives that we use around tokens are things yep. like a token is on the blockchain, right? Yeah. So when we tell people to use their tokens to do this process, their assumption is that whatever decision they're making is like immutable, like, yep. so that has to be implemented. But actually, that's not the case, right? Contracts are written kind of after and then implemented. So what I'm also then starting to recognize is that because of the lack of transparency and information in regards to this, how do we actually develop trust within people thinking that this is going to happen. Same thing with like reputation, right? So there's like social reputation, but how do we do on chain reputation? And so I think then my question then is, is that, you know, using these like on chain methodologies and reputational badging systems to determine like how effective like people have or active have been in governance. Like, I think that there's even a bigger issue in which like, we're, I'm not like, we're not lying to people. But like, yeah. there's this perceived idea that when people vote on Snapchat, <laughs> that it's on chain. And so like, where do you think that that gap of not telling people that it's not <laughs> stops happening? Because to me, it seems very important. You know what I mean? Oh, I'm going to vote for this municipal election. Actually, we don't like have any like reason to really enforce it. Like, you know what I mean? So I think right. like, how do we, how do we bridge that gap? telling people like if you vote for this this will actually happen um, yeah. as opposed to like your you know half half kind of thing right and you know like in snapshots defense like on-chain voting was basically prohibitive until about six months ago because everything was being done on ethereum mainnet where it's very costly to do these kinds of votes they are to clarify, it's not snapshot that I'm talking about. I'm talking about okay. it's the DAO's responsibility to tell people how this tool really? is being used. Right, right. And and I think I think it's just one of those things where like when people see the benefits, that's what's gonna teach them, right? It's like, and the, again, those benefits might be years away, but like when they start getting those airdrops because of the on-chain voting they did on joke DAO, like long term they're going to realize there's a massive benefit to doing on-chain voting, right? Um, and it's giving them like a lot more access and opportunities because that record is there. Um, when they are able to create profiles for themselves and show that they are an active contributor in community and show how active they are relative to others and you let that shape their on-chain resume, like they're going to realize that on-chain voting is, is, is really powerful, right? But like fundamentally, yeah, I think it's just going to be when people see the rewards of it it's going to teach them best and like frankly those rewards are probably you know a year or two away like um because on-chain voting is still so new and so not the norm i, I think like it's just us and dow house are the only ones who do on-chain voting i don't think anyone else <laughs> really does it tally's integrated uh dow house i guess like but um it's rare it's really rare um and yeah it's the same thing as like web3 versus web2 generally right which is like how do we win we just have to show people that they get a better experience and like unfortunately that's not a short-term thing short-term on-chain voting is more painful you have to pay for it you have to prove a transaction it's annoying but long term the benefits are huge and so i think it's just yeah it's just waiting out to see those long-term benefits i don't know that i have a good answer for this <laughs> i struggle with this too because like it is the part of our pitch that is like long term the most impactful, but short term the least. And so, like, very, very hard to convince people of this unless they're already on chain maximalists. So, or there's I think a community like, that's aligned, is what I was saying. Like, if you yeah. if you have a smaller community and you have that case to prove that like it's been really active, then on chain right. voting, even on the short term, makes sense. Well, and, and I mean, also just think about anonymous voters, you know, that, that person who doesn't want to be doxxed, who has a wallet and they voted for something. This is where I mean, like having, you know, multi-party messaging would be huge because like you could reach out to them, you could build something with them all on chain without them ever having to dox themselves, you know, in any way whatsoever. And like, that's huge too. Um, but 
yeah, it's going to take a while before we get there. <laughs> so what I wanted to say, we have last four, three, four minutes. So maybe, uh, David, you want to spend those two, two minutes uh, to tell us like what's next for Joe Dow, you know, like what you are mo the most excited about, like on your roadmap and like maybe what DAOs or other organizations start like using or forking uh, Joe Dow and maybe even uh found their own use case of what you have put out there yeah 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 um great thinking so next up is executable contracts so you'll be able to automatically set rewards for a winner of a contest so if they win you like you let's say you have a hackathon and you're like submit your best idea and then a thousand usdc automatically goes to them right at the end of it uh and again one of those nice things from from on-chain voting that you get uh after that we're going to work on tournament mode um we also have some some quick releases coming this week with pagination and also with um, submission tokens. So you can have one community that can submit and another one that can vote, um, which is pretty cool. So like, you know, for example, let's say I'm in a DAO and I want to like, I want to welcome in the white hat hackers who gave money back to Nomad. So I could like release them a submission token to be like, why should you join our community? And then have the community vote on which ones we want to join and then reward them. Um, when they get in, right? So you can start using it for like, yeah, um, stuff like that. Um, tournament mode, which I described earlier, will be a big one. Uh, figuring out the math for that is really going to be my next month uh, and uh, interesting challenge to approach. Uh, and then long term, you know, yeah, there's a lot to do with storage and NFTs and indexing. Um, but I think like thinking about this as a social platform and like that question of how do you reach other people and 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 um, build with them is the maybe the one that excites me the most. Um, privacy options also is something on our radar that we're looking you know, more deeply into. Uh, and then figuring out how to get more grants to keep building this <laughs> is, uh, is another piece of it. And, and um, also likely to be a good part of my time. Uh, I know we're almost at time. Yeah, in terms of communities using us, um, you know, we've had like Packy McCormick and Tally, Coinbuys, um, all use us. We're in talks with, I would say, top, by DeFi protocols, but I shouldn't name them yet, <laughs> um, about using us as well. Uh, we're about to put a proposal to Maker later today um, for using us along the lines that we just I, I, I just outlined as well. And um, so far, the Maker governance team has been really supportive, so that's been really cool. Uh, and then we have some cool forks, and then like, yeah, there's just, you know, today I was looking at David Rudnick's NFT project, which is like a way for NFTs to, um, become indexes of content. So if you own an NFT, a Tombs NFT from, from David's project, um, you can allow proposals for people to um, submit projects that would be stored in your metadata. And then your NFT becomes almost a library of other people's content that you've personally supported. And so like that's very, very much aligned with what we're doing. I don't know that we'll end up being able to work together, but hopefully we can, um, you know, because it's it's again, like another way where fundamentally what we're building is decentralized curation like it's just a way to curate options to the top right and like the more that you think about web 2 being like standardized curation and indexing and web 3 being very customized and personalized uh curation and indexing like that's that's in many ways what what we're we're really enabling um and yeah as a form of governance so i yeah that was the the mess of an answer <laughs> perfect uh Thank you very much for that. Actually, I had just like question if your uh, Lens protocol maybe it's on the roadmap as well because I see some similarities in there. I would love to work with Lens. Uh, I put in a you know an application for a grant for them and I haven't heard back yet. Um, but uh, there's a lot of potential synergy there. Um, uh, I will just say other parts of the Ave team have been very supportive of us. We got a grant from Ave itself, uh, which made a big difference to us uh and discussions have been really awesome for lens in particular yeah like thinking about having people being able to build out social profiles and then track you know what they're doing on there would be really cool um they've also done like they're doing some stuff with biconomy with like gasless relayers like uh, the coolest thing which um comes from you know a, a friend of mine adave is like the idea of um, being able to have like anyone submit options on Twitter and then automatically relay those gaslessly into a joked out contest. And so like starting to get interoperable with Web2 products would be really, really cool. And like Lens is just awesome that way. Like they're really, really interoperable and like just love what they're building. And yeah, I appreciate you bringing them up. 
that would be that would be very dope sounds perfect uh so thank you very much for coming uh themes do you have anything to add or close to close the session no this has been really really fun i mean i think that as we grow having these conversations are important and just temp checking and having a community to temp check with so hopefully this was as valuable for us as it was for you david <laughs> I had a blast. Yeah, no, and awesome. it's, it actually helped me through a lot of things as well. So really, really appreciate all you're making time. Yeah, Perfect. thanks for coming yeah. up. This was awesome. Cool. Thanks so much, everyone. No worries. Thank Next you. Week, I, I think it's GSE with uh, with Ox Justice, right? Yes, yeah, so Bankos DAO, actually, uh, the governance team, uh, it's coming next week, uh, Justice. So I will actually ask him to maybe watch this one because it was something for, uh, as a suggestion for Bankos DAO. So David, if you have time next week, the same time, yeah. just join as a participant. Like they will be presenting what new governance structure they are kind of proposing for Bankos DAO. So it will yeah. be super valuable, you know, get, go to your uh, input as well. Yeah, if you were comfortable connecting with me with them, I would love to speak to them too, if it's helpful. But maybe they should watch this first and then decide if it's worth their time. They will be here next week. I'll, so I'll you can here, talk yeah. on this call and then you can connect uh, anytime. Yeah. Cool. That sounds perfect. I'm putting in my calendar right now. Perfect. And uh, I think we can uh, end this recording with that. I think you need to end it, uh, themes.